Good evening, everybody. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I am so excited to welcome you to tonight's conversation between a big, two big fan favorites, Dr. Larry Steinberg and Dr. John Duffy. Thank you for attending. Uh, for those of you who are new to FAN, we're a nonprofit organization and we create a high quality speaker series that we offer free to the general public. Uh, the topics have a, uh, tons of different, um, let's start that again. We have a wide variety of topics. How about that on human development, mental health, education, and social justice, among many others. We have over 100 videos of our past events on our YouTube channel. They're also archived on our website. So please be sure to explore over there as well. And make sure you follow us on social media. We're also on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram. Uh, it's now my pleasure to welcome back. I'll introduce both speakers now, though only Dr. Steinberg will be on screen first. It's a pleasure to welcome back Dr. Lawrence Steinberg, one of the world's leading experts on adolescence. It, uh, he's a distinguished university professor and the Laura H. Carnell Professor of Psychology at Temple University. He taught previously at Cornell, the University of California, Irvine, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's the author of more than 450 articles and essays on development during the teenage years and the author, co-author or editor of 17 books a nationally and internationally renowned expert on psychological development during adolescence, Dr. Steinberg's research has focused on a range of topics in the study of contemporary adolescence, including adolescent brain development, risk-taking and decision-making, parent-adolescent relationships, adolescent employment, high school reform, and juvenile justice. Uh, he is, let me just say before I introduce Dr. Duffy, who you'll see in about a half hour, Dr. Steinberg, who was here for us, I believe in 2014, Dr. Steinberg's name comes up over and over and over again in conversations here in Fanland. His, his talk that he did for us back then was so sharp and on point, so knowledgeable, we adore him and we're thrilled that he can come back uh, and give us his points of view about COVID, um, college during COVID. Now, on to Dr. Duffy who we also adore. And we just hosted Dr. Duffy this past winter. Dr. John Duffy is a highly sought after clinical psychologist, best-selling author, podcaster, and parenting relationship expert. He has been working in his clinical practice with individuals, couples, teens, and families for nearly 25 years. Dr. Duffy is the author of the number one bestseller, Parenting the New Teen in the Age of Anxiety, and the number one bestselling, The Available Parent. He is co-host of a popular podcast called Better with his wife, Julie, as well as the podcast On Purpose with Heidi Stevens. So Heidi, we know you're watching tonight. We hope you're feeling better. And now let's welcome Dr. Larry Steinberg. Myself. Hi, um, I hope uh, all of you can hear me just fine. Let Lonnie know if you cannot. Um, thank you all for attending this webinar on this very important and difficult topic. Um, let me give you a little background about myself and how I got interested in this. Uh, I'm a developmental psychologist. I study uh, adolescents and young adults, uh, basically development from about age 10 to 25 or so. Um, and I have uh, done a lot of work in recent years on risk taking and decision making. And obviously, uh, what we're trying to do in responding to the pandemic is to get everybody to not take risks. Um, and young people are very hard to persuade in that department. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw, I was watching a broadcast of 60 Minutes in early June, in which the uh, uh, president, I believe, of the University of North Carolina and somebody from their School of Public Health were talking about that university's plans. Um, and I turned to my wife who was watching with me and I said, these people are crazy if they think this is going to work because it's not going to work. And over the next couple of weeks, um, with help from the editors of the New York Times, I wrote an op-ed that was published in the middle of June, in which I said that the plans that were being announced, not only by North Carolina, but by many other universities, um, were so unrealistically optimistic that they bordered on delusional. Um, and that it was unlikely that students uh, would follow the guidelines that the universities were asking them to follow and that what would happen was that uh, students would um, comply um, with these directives for a couple of weeks um, and then they would become cavalier 
about social distancing and masking, and they would start uh, returning to what college students do, which of course is not only go to class, but socialize. And once they start to socialize, that would then uh, bring uh, college students into contact with people that weren't necessarily living on campus or were living off campus or living in frat houses or sorority houses, and the virus would um, spread. Now, the concern there um, is not only whether it spreads among students, although I will have something to say about that in a moment, but it's also that the students uh, can spread the virus to adults that they come into contact with, faculty members like myself, um, but also uh, uh, employees of their college or university and residents of the town um, in which they live. Um, and so the danger wasn't just to the students, the danger was to the whole community. With regard to the danger to the students, I just want to say something that I wish the media would do a better job of saying. Um, death is not the only bad outcome um, of COVID. Uh, and, and that is what tends to be focused on. That tends to be the statistic that's reported. And I think that has created a sense of false confidence, um, particularly among young people who have been told over and over again that it's unlikely that they're going to die um, from contracting this virus. That may be true, um, but what is not being discussed is that the virus does damage to organs and organ systems that can persist and that can resurface at a later point in time. And we simply don't know what the lung and heart function of uh, these young people are going to be like um, in five or 10 years. And so I don't think that we should convince people that because they're not going to die from it, they don't need to do anything to avoid it. That's, that's wrong. So did my prediction come true that these policies and plans were going to lead to an increase in transmission on campus? Um, by and large, yes. So let me tell you where we are um, as of today. Uh, there are about 200,000 cases of COVID infection on uh, colleges and universities in the United States. Um, we are sure that that is an underestimate. Um, for one thing, uh, schools are often reluctant to report the full number of cases. And for another, there are many colleges and schools that simply will not report um, their data to the organizations like the New York Times that are tabulating it. So probably there are a lot more than 200,000 cases. Many of you who are watching from the Chicago area are at an incredible nexus of college cases. As of October 8th, there were 7,000 cases at Illinois colleges and universities and 7,000 at Wisconsin's uh, colleges and universities. So it is spreading and many of the hotspots in, in the country right now are hotspots uh, that are in communities in which colleges and universities are located. So uh, as, as I uh, feared, um, the spread uh, of the virus on college campuses is also affecting um, the residents of the communities um, in which they go to school. Um, it is difficult to say exactly what we should do um, about this. I want to say a, a few words about um, the plans um, that colleges and universities put in place, um, why they did what they did, and why they're probably not working. Um, most colleges and universities were faced with a dilemma of whether they should um, uh, go back to campus, because remember a lot of them had terminated on campus teaching last spring, um, or whether they should teach remotely or whether they should use some kind of a hybrid system. Uh, the, why, why do that? If in fact we, we knew um, or we had a good suspicion of what was going to happen. And a colleague of mine uh, asked administrators at his university, and I won't identify that school, um, if any of them had thought about consulting with adolescent development experts in developing their plan. And I think that the administrator's answer to that is very revealing and really tells the story. The answer was no, because they don't know anything about money. Um, now, many of you probably don't realize this, but many, most colleges and universities in this country derive about 30% of their revenue um, from uh, room and board, mostly from the board part of it. So it is in their interest to get as many students back to campus as possible. And if they can't do that, they are in a real financial bind. So the financial problem is real. Um, 
And um, the only way that it could be solved, short of Congress bailing out colleges and universities, um, would be to get more people to, to live on campus. The problem to me from the beginning was not the teaching part of it. I'm confident, and I see this at my own university, at Temple University, I'm confident that we can arrange classrooms um, so that they're safe, so, so that the seats are spaced uh, uh, appropriately, so that there are plexiglass shields, so that people are, um, have access to hand sanitizers and are masked while they're in class. I wasn't concerned about that and I'm not concerned about it now. The problem has to do with residential life and whether it's possible in a population of people um, who are prone to make risky decisions, especially in social situations, um, to reconfigure dormitories um, in a way that's gonna minimize transmission um, and to deal somehow with students who are living um, off campus. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the research that we do and why I think it's informative to this. If you look at risky behavior as a function of people's age, what you see is that virtually any type of risky behavior peaks um, just exactly during the age period that describes undergraduates. So it peaks around 18 to 19 or 20 years old. Um, that's the population of people whom we're trying to persuade not to take risks. Why is risk taking so prevalent um, at this age? And why is it so hard to deter? We have been studying this by looking at adolescent brain development, and we've developed a theory which has held up very well, um, which is that there is a, um, a, a disconnect between systems of the brain that respond to reward um, and to social stimuli like other people and systems of the brain um, that uh, provide us with the ability to control our impulses and urges. And during adolescence, that system of the brain that affects how we respond to reward becomes increasingly more arousable. Um, we understand that this is because of the effect of puberty on the brain, um, but if you um, do imaging studies in which you compare children and adolescents and adults um, when they're watching something that is a positive stimulus, like people smiling, you see much more activity in the reward centers of the adolescent brain than you do um, in uh, children's or adults' brains. Um, so uh, the college students that we're talking about are hypersensitive to reward. They're very interested in seeking out rewarding and uh, novel experiences. And they're particularly sensitive to social reward. So while this is going on, a part of the brain that we've heard of is the social brain um, is also becoming much more easily aroused. And so when we show um, adolescents, and this includes um, college students, um, social stimuli, they also are more active um, in those stimuli than our children or adults. So you have, when you're talking about a college student, you have somebody who's very, very interested in pursuing novel and exciting and new and rewarding social experiences. Um, the problem is that that occurs during a time when the part of the brain that uh, uh, helps us rein in our impulses and control our emotions is still immature. That part of the brain we have found um, is still maturing at around age 22 or so. So you have this period of time where the accelerator is pressed to the floor, but there's not a good braking system in place. Um, the problem that faces those of us who teach or work with or parent teenagers is that there's pretty much nothing we can do uh, about this. Um, the, the increase in reward sensitivity is due to puberty. We're not gonna stop people from going through puberty. Um, the immature cognitive control is due to the way that the brain develops. We might be able to speed it up a little, um, but we can't snap our fingers and turn an adolescent um, into an adult. And so the group of people that college administrators are trying to dissuade from taking risks is a group of people who are the hardest people um, to, to do this with. Um, and so I think that the colleges were setting themselves up for a, a massive kind of failure. And so here we are now. Um, it's, uh, it's rampant on college campuses. Um, it's increasing um, uh, in its spread. Um, it is infecting not only students, but people who live 
um, in the communities um, in, in which they uh, go to school. A lot of schools, including my university, Temple, changed plans midstream. So after Temple found that there were surges in cases on our campus, I think it, this happened at about 200 cases, uh, Temple decided to uh, move more classes um, to remote and to try that plan for two weeks. They tried it for two weeks and cases still increased and they decided that this is the permanent solution for the rest of this semester. We have a few handful of classes um, on campus that are taught person uh, to person, but most of them, like mine, uh, which is a course in adolescent development, conveniently enough, um, are, are being taught remotely. Some of the students who are taking remote classes are still living where they had been living before. Many of them have moved back in um, to their uh, parents' home. And I want to now turn to um, what some of the issues seem to be that are arising in homes where college students have returned um, after uh, finding out that their instruction was only going to be remote. Um, and I discussed this with my class today because uh, I wanted to find out from them what was happening in their families. And so some of the issues that they mentioned are ones I'm going to mention, but there are others on my list as well. Um, the first uh, has to do with parents adapting to having a college age person um, in the home whom they lived with when he or she was a high school age person. Um, the college age person, especially if the person is now 20 years old, um, is not going to return to the rules and regulations and expectations um, that guided the way that that family functioned when he or she was in high school. Families have a hard time dealing with this. It is very easy for them to fall back into old patterns of interaction, and maybe Dr. Duffy can say a little bit about this, it's very easy for them to fall back into old patterns of interaction that are not appropriate for somebody um, a, a college student's age. And this, um, as you would expect, annoys the college students and it creates uh, many, many opportunities for conflict while they're resolving. So the first issue is what I would call autonomy issues. And so my advice to parents is that this all needs to be renegotiated with your um, with your child's new age um, in in mind. The second issue is that a lot of parents are not really familiar with it, with what it's like to go to college today. Um, one of my students was telling me today that um, one of the big sources of conflict in his house, he's moved back in with his parents, um, is the um, uh, amount of time his parents expect him to devote to chores. And he says his parents have no idea how much work he has to do. Um, not only attending remote classes, but doing all the work that's assigned um, remotely and keeping up with all the classes that he's taking. And so it's important that parents really have um, a, a, a full understanding of what their college age child's life is like, um, how much time it takes to do well um, in school, and how to help set the home up um, uh, in a way that provides opportunities for quiet space, for studying, for reading, and for doing the kinds of things that college students need to be able to do. Um, a third issue which has come up more recently um, concerns um, the, the transition of students from college back home. As many of you probably know, um, a lot of universities have decided um, to not have uh, students back after Thanksgiving break is over. So the students will be leaving campus uh, right uh, at the week before Thanksgiving and not returning um, for how long we don't know at this point. Now, some of these students, even those who are asymptomatic, are going to be able to still infect other people and they may be returning home from college um, with an unknown infection that they may transmit to older people in their family um, who are more vulnerable and, and more likely to suffer severe consequences from um, the infection. So it's very, very important that if your student is going to be coming home for the holidays, um, that you insist that your student spend two weeks in a self-imposed quarantine, um, either on campus or, or somewhere else. Um, and that will allow the student to come back safely. Many universities can help with this. Um, some have created uh, dormitories that are 
for the sole purpose of quarantining um, individuals who are infected. Um, and um, and it, it's important that you express that to your college age student that uh, it is too dangerous to come home uh, with an effect that can be given to older people um, in the family. Um, testing, of course, is very, very um, important and we should be doing that regularly. Um, some of you I know have questions about what have the successful colleges and universities done um, that has worked. I think there are um, two things that are important here um, that characterize the schools that have been better at stopping the surge. Um, the first is very frequent testing. Um, some universities are testing their students two or three times a week. Um, and the testing is followed by um, contact tracing um, and, uh, of course, social distancing and quarantine um, if somebody tests positive for it. Um, one, you might ask, why isn't everybody doing this? Because it's very expensive. A very good friend of mine is the president of a very small liberal arts college. And she told me that it would cost her college $2 million a semester to test all their students weekly, much less um, more than once a week. So the more affluent, wealthier universities with the bigger endowments um, are, are much more able to do this. And the poorer universities that don't have a lot of resources um, have more trouble doing it. It's also the case um, that universities that are relatively smaller um, and smaller colleges have been more successful. And I think that's because those schools have been able to create an atmosphere of community there where um, behaving in a socially responsible way um, is, uh, is expected and is a part of your membership um, in that college and university community. Now, I want to conclude by saying something that I think is not said often enough. Um, adolescents are not behaving the way that they're behaving because they're bad people. And they're not behaving the way they're behaving because they don't know what they should do. Um, they're behaving the way that they're behaving in many instances because they can't help it. Um, and I believe that universities and colleges um, should have foreseen this and perhaps not placed the expectations on students um, that they have placed. Um, someone asked me once if I think that the spread of COVID on campus is the student's fault or the administration's fault. And I said, if parents of an infant who is crawling don't put caps over the electrical outlets and the infant sticks things in the outlets, are you going to blame the infant for doing that? Or are you going to blame the parents for not capping them? Um, I don't think we should have expected college students, given what we know about their brain development and their socialization uh, expectations. I don't think we should have expected them to behave the way that they needed to behave in order to stop the spread of the virus. Um, and I think we've put them uh, in, a, in a kind of impossible situation. Um, I. Uh, I can talk more if you want about how I'm teaching my class um, remotely. I think it's been successful. The students think it's successful, but that may be idiosyncratic to me and the course and the students who are taking it. So I'll, I'll wait on this. Um, so I'd like to hand it off now to Dr. Duffy um, and uh, he's going to speak for a while and then we're going to have a conversation about this. So uh, take it away. Thanks so much, Dr. Steinberg. Um, and I have to say, I am so grateful to be talking to you tonight and to be hearing from you tonight. Um, as a clinical psychologist, I am um, dealing with young people every single day who are struggling with some of the very, exactly the things you're talking about. And I find myself, even pre-pandemic, concerned about the well-being of a lot of these young people. And now, in the midst of this, even more so, because this is so highly unusual and there are so many variables that are isolating and upsetting and missed opportunities. And, and there, there's a few things I would love to work through with you. Um, I'm going to try to read the mind of our audience just for a second here um, and ask what I think might seem like an obvious, ridiculous question, but I think it's worth asking. Um, we talk about the risk-taking behavior of these young people and that this is part of the normal developmental process of adolescence. And I can imagine that if I am listening to us here, 
I'm wondering, is that an absolute? In other words, is there an end around that? My kid is shy, not necessarily always taking risks. Um, my child in particular is, particular, uh, is anxious about the virus itself. So is there um, a way to develop through adolescence into adulthood without going through this particular part of the phase? Well, um, I think probably not. Now, I, I, now I think that um, there are reasons that adolescence is a time when people um, are more likely to engage in risky behavior. Um, not to get too academic about it, but um, we believe that um, we, uh, as humans, evolved to have adolescence be a time when people are more tolerant of risk taking because um, one of the tasks of mammals, as we are, um, is to separate from um, the adults that have protected uh, one for a while and go out into the wild and try to become an independent um, uh, member of the species community. Um, that is a dangerous thing to do. Uh, and um, I think a lot of people wouldn't do it if they had a very low tolerance for risk. I think that the, 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 the way to think about this is can we channel young people's natural inclinations to engage in risky behavior um, into the kind of risky behavior that's not gonna harm them. And, and one of my students and I have been studying what we call positive risk taking, because there are all kinds of situations that our, our, our kids get into, trying out for a part in the school play, uh, uh, asking somebody out that you feel nervous about uh, talking to, raising your hand in class, taking a class that's harder than what you're accustomed to taking. And we, I think it's fair to say that we want our, our children and teenagers to take those risks. We don't want them to take the kind of risks that are gonna hurt them um, or maybe even kill them. So um, one challenge I think for parents and for schools um, in the midst of where we are right now is to find ways of providing opportunities for positive risk taking um, to a group of people that probably have a strong need to, to do that um, so that it, 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 maybe, it maybe fulfills some of that uh, in a way that's gonna prevent some of the negative and harmful risk taking. I love that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So I, I was thinking as you were speaking about the setup of a university and you, you work at, at Temple and, you know, and I, I love campuses and I work with a lot of young people who will describe that, you know, like everything about the setup from the moment I arrive as a freshman suggests getting together socially and meeting in groups and you know um and having parties and and uh and doing all the things that they are now um encouraged not to do and i totally understood your point when you said well i think we can manage the classroom element of this it's the social element of this that might be more difficult to manage and i'm thinking about some of the people i know and i work with um who uh, to your point um are not kind of minimizing the damage of the pandemic or the lethality of it. But there is this pleasure center in the brain that suggests like, mm, I'm not going to bring uh, this thing home to my parents or my grandparents. So I'm willing to take this risk and I don't think I'm going to get it anyway. So I'm going to go to the party or I'm going to go to the thing that is fun and um, kind of turn off that part of my brain that says, you know, like, exercise due caution here. Um, I know that some smaller schools, as you're saying, are able to create this communal atmosphere, but for schools that aren't able to do that, is there, is there any other way that you can think of to kind of get kids to get young people to think in a different way about this particular risk? Because we talk a lot about like, you know, driving too fast, um, risky sexual activity, uh, drinking too much. But this is new and very, very different. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity here with this particular risk, given that, it's the, given that we now are all learning about it together, that might be useful in a way in getting young people to understand something about it that might change their behavior a little bit. I think that's the right question, and I think it's a, it's a terrific question, and I'm glad that you began by acknowledging how important socializing is um, to, to college students. I, I think that 
um, as those maybe who are paying the tuition, uh, we think of college as mainly an academic um, experience where our kids are going to learn things that are going to help them pursue either further education or get a good job in the labor force when they graduate. Um, but that's not what college is about. I mean, college really, um, particularly for the students that live on or near campus, college is about the social relationships. Um, and that's not a bad thing at, at all. Some of the closest friends people make for life are people that they met in college. Many people meet their future spouse um, in college. Many of the people, uh, and I went to a small college, many of the people that I knew at the college that I attended were important intellectual influences on me from the, the conversations that we would have outside of class. And so when you take the social aspect of college out of the picture, I, I think it's not college anymore, or it's not college as, as we know it. You might as well be taking a correspondence class. Um, so I, I think that your, to your question specifically, let me divide it into two pieces. One is, um, are there things that universities can do and the other are the things that parents can do, especially if their kids are living at home. Universities see, seems to me have followed two strategies, um, both of which I think are only marginally successful. Um, one is education. So that there are constant reminders um, of social distancing, of hand sanitizing, um, of, uh, 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 of, of staying outdoors if you can and not interacting with people um, indoors and so on. Um, that works up to a point, but I think we know from looking at health education um, and sex education and drug education in this country that you can only gain so much through education, right? I mean, 99% of American adolescents get this kind of education, and yet, last I saw, you know, the last time they had sex, 40% of American teenagers didn't use condoms. So, some, so there's a disconnect between how we're educating them or what we're teaching them and how they behave. And so I think that the, the problem is that um, it's not a lack of education that's leading to the risky behavior. It's, a, it's an inclination that I think is largely biological in nature that's very hard to, to put the brakes on. And I think a lot of students can put the brakes on for a while, but it's just gonna be a matter of time before somebody comes knocking on their door with a beer saying, do you wanna come down the hall? We've got a good party going on. And I think, it's, I think the education for a lot of kids will just go out the window. The other thing that colleges and universities are doing, uh, which I don't think has been successful, is, is, is being punitive, right? So there, we know we've heard stories about schools that have expelled students um, for violating the, the campus guidelines and, and regulations. Um, I, don't, I don't think that punishment works very well in deterring people in general. And so you may be getting rid of those individuals, but I don't believe that this is gonna have an impact um, on the other individuals. Because as you said, um, Dr. Duffy, that, that, that most students are under the impression that they can behave that way and not catch it. And so, so they, they might look at somebody who was expelled and say, well, you know, we did a dumb thing, but you know, I'm gonna do it and I'm not gonna catch the virus. And they're just gonna hope that what they don't catch is the college's attention when they're behaving badly. So let me, let me talk about parents for a moment and for the meeting the social needs of college students who are living at home. I think it's possible to um, work with your child to create friendship pods, that is small groups of, of close friends who um, know each other and trust each other and are willing to be tested frequently um, and to quarantine if they test positive and to meet together under relatively safe circumstances, like um, out, you know, outdoor activities that's gonna be tough in Chicago uh, come December, um, but there, there are, you know, open the windows in the rooms in, in which you are. We've been told that that, that that is helpful. So I don't think that the right answer for parents is to make their college student cut off all social relationships. I think it would be better if you and your uh, child together can come up with a plan that's going to allow a limited amount of safe socializing. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that last thought. I think that's like really, really useful. I find that with my clientele frequently, um, both on campus and off. Um, what I am running into also, and I'm kind of curious 
to hear what your thoughts are on this, um, is a degree of hopelessness among some of the young people. So on top of this willingness to take risks, there's also this belief that hmm, I'm not certain that this is gonna get better or how much better it's gonna get during my tenure here at this school. So in a way, I'm gonna get while the getting's good. I'm going to um, attend the events and I'm going to be social while I can because like last semester, I suspect things are going to shut down here at some point or you know, I'm gonna, my social life is gonna be greatly restricted um, and so I will take the risks now because I don't know that I'll have the opportunity to do so later. Do you have any thoughts about how to mitigate that way of thinking? Yeah, um, of course, it's so easy to feel hopeless and we all feel hopeless about this situation um, from time to time. I, I, I think it's important to recognize that this will be over at some point. I, I think when there is a vaccine um, that is widely distributed and widely available, um, we will start to get this under control. Um, there are some people who are proposing that we work for herd immunity, but you have to get more than 50%, I think it's like 60% or 70% of the population um, to be infected in order to have herd immunity when the virus has no longer new cases to infect. Um, we're very, very far from that. So I think that's unlikely to happen. So the question really, I, I would reframe the question if I had a child who had that attitude, um, which first of all, um, it's a terrible thing to get this infection. I mean, you might not feel sick right away from it, but we don't know what's gonna to happen to you in the future. And we don't know who else you're endangering by being infected. And if you care about your grandparents, um, you don't wanna get infected and have any contact you know, with them. Um, or, or if somebody in your family has an immunosuppressive you know, disorder or heart disease, um, you don't wanna get near that person with an infection. So what I try to, to, to say to young people that I speak with about this is let's think of a stopgap measure that's gonna work for you know, a semester, maybe a year, because probably by then it's gonna be safe to go back to campus. And so I think that there are, um, there are a couple of reasonable stopgap measures to, to think about. One is learning remotely. Now I know that this is not the same as learning on campus, um, but I have discovered um, in my class this year, and I can say a little bit about how I've done it, um, that the remote instruction in some ways has been better um, than the in-person instruction in the same class. Um, so let me tell you what, I, what, what, what I've done to make that happen. It's a senior seminar on adolescent development. I have 20 students in it. Ordinarily, I would teach this, uh, we would meet two times a week for about an hour and 10 minutes on typically Tuesdays and Thursdays or Mondays and Wednesdays. And I would teach it in person and we would do the usual. Um, I decided to try to do something different this semester in light of the remote experience. Um, I divided the class into four groups of five students each. And I meet with each group of students, just the five of them and myself, um, once a week, you know, just for an hour or so. So they're not in class for two and a half hours a week. They're in class for less than that, but they get much more attention and contact with me. And I can honestly say that I know these 20 students much, much better, and we're only halfway through our semester, than I would know them um, if I were teaching them in person. The reason that I structure it this way is that for one thing, it's very hard to have a Zoom conversation with more than a half a dozen people. And those of us who are stuck in Zoom hell meeting you know, all day long know what that's like. Um, and, and the other is that it's very hard to get somebody to pay attention um, for much more than uh, 45 minutes or so. And so there really isn't any point in trying to, to do it and do it. Um, the reason I say that is that remote learning isn't such a terrible thing. Um, and let's keep in mind that before the pandemic, a lot of colleges and universities offered remote courses. And so somebody must have thought that this is an okay way to educate people. Um, and somebody must think it's an okay way to learn because those courses enroll a lot of students. And so I, I know it's, I don't mean to sound callous, uh, but it's not the end of the world if you have to go to school remotely for a semester um, or for two. What you're gonna be missing is the social aspect of it. I don't think that your academic learning is gonna be terribly compromised, but you will miss the social aspect of it. And I made some suggestions about how parents can help 
mitigate that somewhat if their students are, are, are living at home. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it's very important for everybody in the family to be patient um, about this. And I know that, uh, Dr. Duffy, that you, a, a main interest of yours has been anxiety and, and related mental health problems. Everybody's anxious. I mean, parents, professors, students, uh, neighbors, I mean, everybody is anxious. And I think if we can help parents learn how to help their children cope with anxiety and, and how to help themselves cope with anxiety, things are gonna be um, much better. So I think that a lot of the a lot of the problems that are coming up in families where college students are living home are really manifestations of, of anxiety and related uh, mental states that get in the way of people, you know, living happily together. Well, I think you're so, I think you're so right about that. And I agree with you that families, every single member of every family is idling on high. And when you get the parent and the teenager both anxious at the same time, that's not particularly useful. Um, I think a lot about how the parents' anxieties often bleed into that of the child, of that of the teenager, um, in ways that are not particularly healthy. Um, I find myself encouraging parents to manage their anxieties outside of the realm of their discussions with their teenager, talk to their partner or talk to another adult. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Because I find that like a lot of the kids I know and I work with are plagued by um, what their parents feel like they're missing. They're missing that season or um, that play or that drop off day or, um, or they're missing just like the normalness of bringing their child to school and just having them away for a while <laughs> as right. opposed to having them down the hall. Right. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, how much we all love routine and, and predictability and certainty. And that is what has been disrupted by, uh, you know, by the pandemic in many, many households. I agree with you that I, I don't think it would be helpful for parents to express or process their anxiety with their children. Um, I think that children are very sensitive to their parents' emotions and that that is going to make their kids more anxious. Um, I think it would be good for parents to try to model some coping strategies that are available to young people as well, like exercise, like meditation, um, like, you know, getting outside the house, putting your mask on and, and going for a walk. And there was an article I read the other day, going for a walk in a beautiful setting, turns out helps people manage their um, anxiety somewhat. So, and, and some of these activities can be done together. Um, and the parent doesn't have to label it as, well, we're going to be doing this to cope with our, our terrible mental states. Um, you know, we're going to be doing this because it's fun. And let's, let's do yoga together. And you can get on YouTube and you can find hundreds, thousands of videos on things like yoga and meditation and different kinds of exercise. And I think it would be good for families to do those activities, um, you know, together or, or not. But so I think that the emphasis on parents should not be in expressing their anxiety to their kids or in front of their kids, but on, on modeling good coping behavior um, and in um, uh, teaching those skills to their kids. We, many of us are worried um, about the increase in drinking and marijuana use among parents that has taken place uh, during the pandemic. Um, and that of course is not a good model for your children on how to cope with stress um, and anxiety, um, and uh, uh, you know, it's it, it, you you need to help teach your child ways of managing stress. I mean, you you need to do that anyway, but now it's much more urgent. And let me just add, and, and I know you know this as well as anybody, um, that we were already in the midst of a, an anxiety epidemic among teenagers and young adults in this country um, before the pandemic. And so you have a lot of people that are coming into this anxiety producing situation with a particular vulnerability to anxiety because they already have um, the condition. And so I think that that has made it maybe doubly hard to, to deal with. Boy, boy, do I ever agree with you. I'm so glad you punctuated the point about marijuana use, alcohol use, 
not just among the teenagers, but among the parents. And that is happening with greater frequency as the months kind of wear on here. So I'm really grateful to you for punctuating that point. That's happening far too often. And there is, whether we like it or not, a modeling element to that that right. we cannot ignore. You're absolutely right. Um, There's a modeling element to it. And let me just interject one other thing, because people not, might not be thinking about it. The quality of your parenting is compromised when you are drinking or, or getting high. And this is a time when parents need to be vigilant about making sure that their child, especially let's talk about high school kids for a moment. Um, it, it is a, um, it's a time when parents need to be especially vigilant um, and to be good parents. And it's just much harder to be good parents if you're intoxicated. Agreed. And, and, and whether we like it or not, modeling is probably, would you agree, one of our most um, potent yep. uh, abilities, right? Our lectures can only go so far, but modeling the behavior, that goes further, without a doubt, yep. yeah? Absolutely. Um, so, so I have a question that is a, um, I'm going to argue that this is a selfish question that I hope some of our listeners <laughs> benefit from. But I've had for you since the, uh, the other day when I, I learned that I would be able to talk to you. Um, I'm working with a few young people who are not bothered by this from a social perspective or from a Zoom call perspective. They're perfectly comfortable in their dorm rooms or in their bedrooms at home on the Zoom calls, isolated. So if they had a fear of missing out, they're no longer seeing that on social media, that there's things that they're missing out on. Uh, if they have school-related anxiety, that anxiety seems to be dissipated to some extent because somehow the Zoom situation feels a little more manageable. And I find myself a little concerned, Doctor, with um, the long-term effects of this. Once things do return back to normal, as you, I think, um, appropriately assure us they will, what will become of these folks who are getting now acclimated to kind of hunkering down and being alone and isolating and finding an unfortunate comfort zone in a pandemic? Good question, difficult question. So let me, let me talk off the top of my head because I haven't really thought much about this, although, I, although it certainly is the case. Um, Lots of these kids, I would imagine, um, were already somewhat less social to begin with before the pandemic. And they, they enjoyed spending time in their bedrooms, you know, playing multiplayer video games or, um, or uh, being on social media or being on the internet or whatever. Um, I'm not so worried about those kids. I mean, they, they have found a way to live with social media that suits their temperament. Um, and I think we know from well done research, there isn't a lot of well done research on social media effects, but I think we know from the better studies um, that social media does not have a stunting effect on kids' social competence or social development. Um, if it has a bad effect, it tends to have a, a, a bad effect on kids that don't have a lot of friends at school and are lonely um, and um, wish they had more friends at school. Um, not the kids that are perfectly happy just being on social media because the, we, in fact, this was the today's topic in my class. The, the kids who have a lot of friends and who are popular in school use social media to stay in touch with those people. And most of what they're getting on social media is positive. They're getting their, see their friends like their pictures and like their posts and so on. So it makes them feel better about themselves. So let's not worry about them. Um, the, the, there are kids who, as I said, can take it or leave it, um, and I'm not worried about them either. But there are kids for whom uh, th th this is um, not a good response because they're, they're kids who aren't so introverted that they don't need contact with other people. Um, I, I think it's very hard to know um, what parents should do except to watch for the signs that this is uh, that this is verging from a, a kind of unpleasant situation into a clinical um, situation, because this is something that can uh, certainly create depression um, and can exacerbate anxiety in individuals. It's also true um, that, there are thing, that there are things one can do besides be on the internet and be at school. 
Right, right. So you can you can be outdoors. Um, you can be you know going for a jog. Um, you can hang out with your parents if everybody is tested negative. I mean, so it's not like the only solution to this problem is to stay in your room um, and and get on Instagram. Right. Right. Um, no, that the, I, I love that the the point about the alternatives that are available that we don't always avail ourselves of. In fact, a lot of the young people I'm working with are more and more complacent and sedentary unnecessarily, to your point. So thank you for that. Right. Um, I think, it, can, let me just say one more thing, because it's a pet peeve of mine. Um, the popular press's portrayal of how social media affect teenagers is so disconnected from reality that it has made people worry much, much more than they need to worry about this. Um, and the question that I always ask parents to ask themselves, if they're worried about their children's social media use is, what, what is this displacing? That is, what is your, your youngster not spending time on that he's now spending on social media? And if the answer is watching television, I'm not worried about, you know, about it. If the answer is sleeping, I would worry more about it. If the answer is um, getting physical exercise, I would worry more about it. If the answer is reading, I would worry more about it. So I think you need to ask, um, ask that important question. What is my child not doing because she's on Snapchat all day long? That's the great point. That's a great point. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm going to take advantage of your insider status here as a, um, as a professor at a university and somebody who is an expert in child development. Can I ask you as best you can to predict the future for us? I think a lot of us are wondering, you know, like, what are we looking at then? Um, we, we know what, what this semester looks like as, as it stands. Do you have a feel for what we're looking at next semester, even next school year? Um, do things become more normal? Are we looking at more of the same and we just need to acclimate to it? Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I do. I mean, of course, none of us should really be in the business of predicting the future. Um, but but I, I, I'm, I'm pretty certain that things are gonna get worse before they get better. I mean, this is what the epidemiologists tell us because as the weather gets colder, people spend more time indoors um, and that's how the virus is um, transmitted. So I, I would guess that very few schools are gonna, that have gone remote are gonna reopen um, with on campus. Um, as for the following academic year, I think it's anybody's guess and I think we'll have a better sense of that, um, uh, you know, next spring when we see what kind of progress we've made um, with vaccines and therapeutics. But, uh, you know, just, there, as I said, there's 7,000 infections on campuses in Illinois. Um, and so th this is not going away, you know, anytime soon. So I, th I think the future is going to hold a mix of remote learning, but on campus learning. Nothing is ever going to replace the social aspect of college. And I think we need to accept that as a fundamental truth about people this age. Dr. Steinberg, Dr. Duffy, here I have reappeared. Uh, it's about 7.55, so I wanna jump in and grab a couple questions that um, we've gotten some great questions from audience during the event. Thank you for the excellent conversation. I appreciate the different directions that it went um, and the depth with which um, Professor Steinberg, or Dr. Steinberg, you answered in particular. I'm gonna grab, we had about 20 questions that were sent in ahead of time. I'm gonna focus uh, for this on people who might still be watching as opposed to people who submitted ahead of time. I wanna start with um, Pam Cassidy who asks, what advice do you have for freshman students who are adjusting to the rigor of academics, most of them online, but also are trying to connect socially to a group? Many are homesick more than usual because many schools are not helping them make social connections because of the physical distancing rules. How can colleges help these kids connect so they feel they are part of a college community? Well, uh, I think that's a great question um, uh, that your um, a fan member submitted. Um, I, think it's very, I think it's very, very hard. This is not what these individuals expected their college experience was going to be like. Um, I think that good universities are, are helping to promote the kinds of activities that are good to in, engage in um, and not simply uh, adopt a punitive stance in, in which all they're doing is warning people about the things that they shouldn't do. 
And so I think a good university will work with students to help them understand the, the best ways to approach remote learning um, and to um, make suggestions for how they can socialize safely. So some, some schools um, arrange outdoor social activities where people can um, be in groups, but where there are social distancing and where because it's outdoors, the risk of infection is, is much less. So I think there are a lot of things that universities can do um, to, to help this. But I think we all have to just be very sympathetic and empathic um, for, with these young people who have spent so much time fantasizing about what this experience is going to be like, um, only to be uh, disappointed. Uh, another question here from Craig. He asks, if it is not college without the social experience, as you indicate, why pay the steep cost for a largely online education without the socialization, without sports, without campus speakers, without concerts, without other fun events? Doesn't a gap semester or a year make more sense? Um, it does to me for some families. Um, in, in terms of the, are you willing to pay for this? I think there are, um, you know, there are a couple of different ways to look at it. Um, one is that the, the university and college, as I mentioned before, is in dire straits. Um, they're not collecting the room and board that they, that they want. Um, and they, one of the only ways that some of these places uh, are gonna survive is by collecting the same amount of tuition money per credit for online classes um, as for in-person classes. Of course, a lot of them were doing that before the pandemic anyway. And so if you care about the school, and, and you want your child to return to that school after the gap semester or gap year, um, you don't want to make that school go out of business. And, and, and by um, not being willing to pay tuition that they need, um, you, you, you may do that. That said, I think it's a personal, it's, it, it's a perfectly reasonable question to ask. Um, and there are um, in like universities like the University of Phoenix and places like that, that are for-profit institutions that are run completely online, that have been in business for a, a long time and that don't charge, charge as much for their uh, classes. So, um, but, but, but I think the difference between taking a remote class at Temple and taking it in one of these for-profit schools um, is huge. And one of the things that you get if you, if you take a remote class at Temple or Northwestern or University of Chicago or University of Illinois, is you're still getting access to some of the world's best professors and experts in their field. Um, and so I, I think that may, maybe that is worth paying for um, just to um, have that ex experience for your child. Okay, I'm gonna squeeze in one more. We're at 7.59, so let's make this the lightning round. Paula asked, how do you account for these adoles those adolescents that are responsible and mature rather than impulsive and risk attracted? Are they outliers? Or are we giving adolescents in general too much of a pass uh, about risky behavior and poor decision making as due to undeveloped brains? So I guess she's highlighting not everybody is yep. like, right. Yeah, but I mean, that's true. It's hard to think of any human quality or behavior where there isn't variability among people of the same chronological age. So in our studies, right, there are 15 year olds who um, are just as competent at making safe decisions as the 25 year olds. And there are 25 year olds who are just as bad as the 14 and 15 year olds. So, I, uh, so rather than ask, how do we account for this? Because I think part of it's genetic and part of it is how people are raised. I think we should say, what, what special provisions might we make for those students that are able to rein in their impulses um, and that don't need um, to be monitored as closely? And what special uh, cautions should we put in place for those students who are particularly impulsive? And so, you know, I think all good parents know this. You have to know your kid and, and know your child's temperament and what, what she or he um, is capable of. Okay, thank you so much. So we're at 801. Um, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. I want a reminder that we're going to start the after hours in about five minutes. We're going to have a, a quick bio break. So if you purchased a book, look for your link now for the after hours for the meeting. Uh, keep in mind that is a, a much more casual gathering. You can ask your own questions. Everybody's visible on screen. So uh, the link has been in chat. You can find that chat there. Uh, Dr. Steinberg, Dr. Duffy, much love to both of you. Thank you for a really stimulating, informative conversation. 